I've tried in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, your word has said, is ever only Jesus. You died, you live, you reign, you plead. There's love in all your words and deeds. This weary heart finds all it needs in ever Jesus, my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you. Jesus, my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I trade my treasures in all my rewards, Jesus, to know. I must know you more Like wave after wave on the ocean Like all of the sand on the shore Your beauty and glory are endless Oh Jesus, I must know you more I want to know Jesus, my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to I have a short little message. Pastor Dave is going to do most of the preaching today, so I just have a little introduction. I wonder very often if the disciples knew what they were, uh, all the writers of the New Testament knew exactly what they were writing, or did they just write, obviously under the unction of the Holy Spirit, without actually understanding a lot of times what they wrote simply because they couldn't understand the future or what the times we're living in so they a lot of it was hidden so the holy spirit just because 
The Holy Spirit gives a person a message doesn't mean he understands it fully. You just have to be obedient and give the message, whether you understand it completely or not, because we always want everything and to do everything by common sense. Uh, my message today, the short little thing that I do have, is put God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit first in your life. I know it's easier said than done, but it is possible. It's a choice we have to make every day and with every step we walk. I have a little bit out of here, a little bit from Oswald Chambers and one by a little bit by Trotter here. Something worth repeating and worth speaking on. But before we do, let's rise and ask the Lord to bless. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, that we will allow you, Holy Spirit, to be present in our lives. Lord Jesus, you gave, as you went up to heaven, Lord, you gave us a comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he's not just a, a word that we repeat. He's actually a part. He's a, a major part of the, of the, the trio, Lord Jesus, and part of our lives. And we want him to influence us, Lord Jesus, even to override our, our what would be stupid decisions that we make so that he will direct our paths in a way of righteousness, Lord Jesus, that we may be, uh, become uh, a vessel that honors and glorifies you in every walk of our life. Thank you, Jesus, for this. You will open people's hearts, even my own understanding to what I'm saying. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray this. Amen. You may be seated. Put God first is uh, out of John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And neither not that any should testify of men, for he knew what was in men. Put trust in God first. Our Lord never puts his trust in any person. Yet he was never suspicious, never bitter. He never lost hope for anyone because he put his trust in God first. There's a scripture that says, I think it's in Corinthians. I always, it was always recited to me in German when I became a Christian. And it was like this in German. Whoever thinks he stands, make sure, take heed that you don't fall. What the scripture means, means is, don't have confidence in your own self, in the flesh. You have confidence in God. This is what this is talking about. Put trust God. You can then stand because he will make you able to stand. He, trust in God. he trusted absolutely in what God's grace could do for others. If I put my trust in human beings first, the end result, and that includes myself, the end result will be my despair and hopelessness toward everyone. You can't trust anyone then. If you do not trust in God, you will always be suspicious of other people. I will become bitter because I have insisted that people be what no person, person can ever be. Absolutely perfect. And right. Never trust anything in yourself or in anyone else except the grace of God. Put God first. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. A person's obedience is to what he sees to be a need. Again, I'll repeat that. A person's obedience to what you obey in is where you see the need. Our Lord's obedience was to do the will of his Father. But the relic right today is we must get to work. The heathen are dying without God. We must go and tell them about him except we must first make sure that God's needs and his will in us personally are met. Jesus said, tarry, in other words, wait until you are endued with power from on high. The, uh, I think I gave him that scripture, did I? <clears throat> Luke 24, 49. The, the, uh, Terry, wait until you are endued with power from on high. The purpose of our Christian training is to get us into the right relationship to the needs of God and his will. Once God's needs in us have been met, we will be open. 
we will open the way for us to accomplish his will, meeting his needs elsewhere. But God's son first. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. God came as a baby, giving and entrusting himself to be me. Giving and entrusting himself to me. He expects my personal life to be a Bethlehem. Am I allowing my natural life to be slowly transformed by the indwelling of the life of the Son of God? God's ultimate purpose is that His Son might be exhibited in me. In other words, shown. That Jesus is shown within us. The Holy Spirit, present or absent. In most Christian churches, the Spirit is quite entirely overlooked. Whether he is present or absent makes no real difference to anyone. Brief reference is made to him in doxology, in short hymnals, or in benediction, in the blessing. Further than that, we might as well, he might as well not exist. Our neglect of the doctrine of the blessed third person has had and is having a serious consequences on our churches. For doctrine is dynamite. It must have emphasis su uh, sufficiently sharp to detonate its power before its power is released, and that is the Holy Spirit. That's where the power of the doctrine is. That's where the power lies. Our words that we speak and that are pre being preached in church are just words. Remember, the Spirit kills. The, 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 the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, even behind my words, even what I'm saying, it's just words. There is nothing behind it. If the Holy Spirit does not touch, move your heart, then we are, what we're doing is all in vain. It's no different than any other religion that anybody else preaches. So what is the difference? Well, we preach that the Holy Spirit is here and he's alive. The doctrine of the Spirit is, is buried dynamite. Its power awaits discovery and use by the church. The power of the Spirit will not be given to any mincing ascent to just any study of Holy Spirit truth. In other words, it's, it, if you just study the Holy Spirit and its truth, it, it, it's not worth anything. The Holy Spirit cares not at all whether we write Him, whether we write him into our creeds and into the back of our hymnals. He awaits our emphasis so that he can be exploited or used in our churches. Lord, grant that I may not resist or doubt and therefore grieve your Holy Spirit. I want to relate a little, bit, a little story that fits into this narrative here. It's, I used to bow hunt. Remember one time I went bow hunting. I did all my prepping. I even I could sh hit and shoot. So as I made my way back to my, my favorite uh, bow hunting place where I did my scouting, I sat down, made myself ready. I forgot my quiver. So I'm sitting there with no arrows, nothing. And you know the frustration, you drive a few miles and you sit down and then I walked another 500 yards, 600, just to get to that spot, and I don't have my arrows with me. It's very frustrating. Now you have to, if you think you're quiet, you did, you, you're settled in. And it took me a bit to figure out that I didn't have my arrows. Now what do I do? So I basically, I didn't do nothing. I just sat and enjoyed wildlife. But the moral of the story is, the arrow is the Holy Spirit. You don't go preaching the gospel or telling people about Jesus without the Holy Spirit being your arrow. So the power behind it, the arrow is what you send flying. The arrow is what you need to do your job there. And the same thing here. The Holy Spirit is what you need to do your work. You might need only a few words to tell somebody. But they, with the power of the Holy Spirit behind it, that can go on. It, can even, it might not even happen right away. It could happen in a situation that, that life, God, the, the person's life may be in, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will bring those words to life that you spoke. And again, that goes back to what my initial story was. I wonder if, I wonder if the writers of all uh, the New Testament understood what they wrote. 
we, we understand, understand them when they hit us, when it touches our heart, and that's through the power of the Holy Spirit moving. And I am a firm believer, even if I drop a few words, timely words, the Holy Spirit can use them then or later on, and they can bear fruit. And that concludes my message. Pastor Dave is going to finish the rest here with his wisdom. Hallelujah. I got a, a preacher said this. Your children are a product of what you did or what you did not do. Take your pick. You either did it or you didn't. Your children are the product. So I can go with that. <laughs> Ignorance, what can I do about it? Uh, the Bible teaches that the lack of knowledge is where a big problem comes in. So we all have to have knowledge. We are destroyed if we don't have any. Anyways, today I want to teach on an interesting message about the Holy Spirit. And I need you to pay attention because we will need it in the future, if not now already. It's talking about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. You know you were Gentiles, carried away with these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaks by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. So if you got preachers out there, they might be ignorant of a lot of stuff. But when they call upon Jesus as the Savior of the world, then that's by the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to them. They might know something that you need to know. Anybody who does not call Jesus Lord, he is not of God. So don't even listen to them. Because they're talking thin air. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now there are diversities of gifts, some but the same spirit. Here's where it gets sticky with many people. They figure, well, the gifts of the spirit, they're not for today. They went out with the apostles. Well, you have a gift. If a bridegroom gives you a gift, and he asks at the wedding feast, well, have you unwrapped your gift? No, I waited till we get married. I didn't quite trust what you give me. What will that bridegroom say? It says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of ministrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God that works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We need to use those gifts to profit one another. Why? To be edified. We need edification. Today, there are many Christians who are so confused. They don't have a clue where they walk. You can see it. You can listen on the internet and you can see the suicide rate going up 
even amongst Christians. What's going on? It's because of confusion. They did not bother to figure out what God had for them. They didn't listen to those who had the gifts of the Spirit. For one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all that work, that one, the self-same Spirit, dividing every man severally as he will. So has God given you any of those gifts? I can tell you, yes, he has. Well, you may say, I don't know. I never experienced it. The reason you never experienced it is because you never unwrapped it. That's the problem. Many Christians today are like the five blind men that walked up to the elephant. One grabbed the tail, one grabbed the leg, one touched the side, one grabbed the ear, one grabbed the tongue, the trunk, and they all went back. And one guy said, one blind man, an elephant, is like a rope. Oh, yes. The elder said, no, no, no. You're wrong. And that's what Christian ministers are doing. You're wrong. It's not a rope. It's a trunk of a tree. I felt it myself. No, 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 the other guy says. It's a wall. He touched the side of the elephant. The other guy said, no, no, no. An elephant is like a big ear, a huge ear. The other said, no, the elephant is like a branch of a tree. It even seems to move in the wind. Were they all wrong? No, none of them were. But they were, they were all right. But they only touched a certain part of the elephant. And that's what Christian ministers and Christians do today. They only study certain parts of Christianity. And they sneer and mock those who manage to touch the side of the elephant, who touch the ear of the elephant, who touch, who touch the leg of the elephant. We should not do that. We should learn from one another. That's the problem in the churches today. We need the Holy Ghost to direct us. There are so many old wineskins in the church today. If you pour in new wine, what happens? They bust. They can't handle the pressure. The question is, does that spell us? I once told God, I don't want to be an old wineskin. I want to be flexible. I want you to pour into me whatever you have. And he's done that. Even though some people don't agree with me, and there are some things I do not want to share. Why? Because I do not like the spirit of of unbelief, especially from a Christian. When an unbeliever doesn't believe you, that's no problem. But when a believer looks at you with sarcasm, when you tell him of something that God showed you, you know 
that that person is locking up his spirit, and God will not dare even touch it. So be careful. You may be locking yourself up to what God is trying to show you. Is he speaking to you in dreams, in vision? Start paying attention. God wants to use you to change things. This is how it works with the gift of the Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to change situations. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues, but the work that one and the self same spirit divide to every man severally as he will. How many in the church are looking at the gift of tongues as if it's of the devil? They even say that's of the devil. The Bible clearly teaches forbid not to pray in tongues. How can preachers do that? You know why? They neglect to touch a different part of the elephant. They're only wagging the tail. It's a rope, it's a rope, it's a rope. You can say what you want. And that's the way they die. God has an elephant. He has a trunk. He has legs as thick as a tree. He has a tail and he has big ears. So, we need to discover that. God has given us the ability, the power of the Holy Spirit to go into the Word of God to find out what He really wants. Many cults, many religions have been started by not touching different parts of the elephant. That's why they run into confusion. That's why their kids leave their faith, because there's nothing there for them. That's why many become confused when they see stuff going on. It doesn't even look like Christianity. Well, maybe it does. Maybe God shows people something a little different. Be pliable. God wants to use you. He wants to show you that he will not be put in a box regardless how you try. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for by one spirit we're all baptized in one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink of one spirit. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're baptized into that body. And you have the responsibility to start using the gifts of the Spirit that God has placed within you. If you don't, you'll have to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. The word of God came very, very sharp and clear to me while I was on my back in the hospital. That scripture that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and that was in the beginning with God. You cannot take scripture and divide him from God. You can't do that. And but at the same time, all scripture is by given by the inspiration of God. 
God wouldn't spend his time writing two chapters on the gift of the Spirit and then just say, there don't really mean anything today. He doesn't teach on hell just to say hell will pass away in a couple of hundred thousand years. He just didn't say God is not mocked. He meant it when he said God is not mocked. Whatever remains souls that he will also reap. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 9, it says, Quench not the Spirit. How do you quench the Spirit? By simply not paying attention to Him. He has a work for you. He has something to offer you. If you don't pay attention, you quench the Spirit. The Bible teaches in the last days, Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. They will prophesy. They will speak of things that we don't understand, that the Bible has to reveal to us. Why? Because God keeps it in until the right time is right. I'm expecting a great revival. Why? It's called the letter rain. And God is not a, a farmer that plants a crop that will have a crop failure. I want to say something. He will have a bumper crop, regardless how many of God's people disagree with him. He will have a bumper crop. Hallelujah. Despise not prophesying. Don't despise prophecies that prophesy of that. God is trying to speak to you. He's trying to tell you there's something on the horizon. Even though he hid it for so long, it was to keep the devil from knowing so that he couldn't dwarf the plan of God. But the harvest is getting ready to be reaped. It's starting to pop up everywhere. Hallelujah. So open your heart to this, for we are in a time where God is going to start moving. We better make sure that old wine sack of ours is flexible so God can put in new wine and use us to do the work of it, Him, or you will be sidelined. It's as simple as that. It's going to be your same old, same old. It's just like the preachers that you're listening to. The same old message that is preached for the last 50 years. You could preach it better than he himself. Prophecy gets you something that is new. It shows you the heart of God. And God is going to reveal it to his children as we get closer to the end. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe him that he is. And he that he is a warder, rewarder, of them that diligently seek him. If you're just going to go down your old path, your old ways, that's not diligently seeking him. You need to step out in faith. You need to try. You need to be like King David. There is an old Goliath standing there. I'm not afraid of him because I practiced my slingshot. I practiced the power of the Holy Ghost. I killed a bear. I killed a lion. And what is that terrible big person there? Watch me take him. Interestingly, one small stone to the center of his forehead 
brought him down. David didn't finish that. He cut off his head and he brought his head to Jerusalem. And if you want to know how Jerusalem was during the time of Saul, it was under the power of the pagans. So that has a specific meaning. God, David took Satan's head. He carried it to Jerusalem where Jesus was going to defeat him. And yes, he did. 2,000 years ago, he defeated the devil at the cross of Calvary. And now you and I can spend our eternity in the eternal portals of glory, glorifying God with what he did for us. Oh, what a joy and a passion and a, and a complete change that will be. So open your heart to these scriptures. God wants to use you. Why does he want to use you? So he can bless you. So he can reward you. So he can give you the best. He just doesn't want you to stand in the back and say, ah, whatever happens, happens. We'll just truck on as usual. Well, if that's your idea, then just sit down on your rear and let the world go by. For God will surely pick you up at the rapture, even if you're a couch potato. Hallelujah. Let the Lord open your heart to this and make you a blessing. Amen. In days of peace, in days of rest, in times of loss and loneliness, the rich or poor, your word is true, that all my ways are known to you. No trial has come beyond your hand, no step I walk beyond your plan. The path is dark outside my view, still all my ways are known to you. And oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be, for all my ways are known to Take my hand and lead me through, for all my ways are known to you. And know oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be, for all my ways are known to you. you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. And oh, what peace that I have found Oh!